Welcome to episode number 120 of the Life Changing Questions podcast. Today, I have a colleague and a friend who is called Corey Minkus. She is the CEO and founder of Rocky Products, which is the number one global product business advisory and growth training company. Corey has mentored, partnered, and designed brand acceleration systems for more than 100,000 emerging businesses and also Fortune 500 business owners over the last 30 years. She is an international speaker in consumer psychology and brand leadership, training clients in 32 countries. Uh, a veteran as a, a physical product growth expert, she has launched and scaled hundreds of products, generating more than 1 billion. Yes, that's 1 billion in retail sales. So uh, as you can imagine, I'm beyond excited to, uh, to welcome you today. Corey, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Kevin. It's so great to be here with you. And I am honored to be on your over 100th interview from your podcast. Congratulations. That's amazing. Oh, well, thank you. We've, uh, we've been fortunate to have some really amazing guests along the way. And uh, today you are that amazing guest. I'm, I'm so excited. We've had the privilege of uh, working together probably, Corey, over five years now. We pre, Pre-pandemic, we got to present in countries like, uh, where were we? Hong Kong, Switzerland, Sweden, we even Israel at some point. Uh, hey, we even made it to Korea at some point. So we've, we've been for a lot of different countries together presenting and serving. And I'm so excited to bring you to, uh, to the audience today because you have this absolute speciality in products and also you know, brand acceleration. So I'm, I'm excited to introduce you. I wonder if you could share with us a little bit about your journey because I, uh, I know you're an entrepreneur now, but you didn't start off necessarily from the beginning in an entrepreneurial sense. So I'd love to hear a little bit about your background. How did you arrive at where you are now? Sure. Thank you, Kevin. Again, thank you so much for having me here and, and appreciate being able to share hopefully impact around the globe for women entrepreneurs and, and women in business. So I started my career 30 years ago in corporations here in the United States, uh, working in multinational corporations, traveling around the world with them and helping them to expand their brands and spent the first 25 years in different senior level executive positions well, let's say I started originally probably in not so senior level positions, <laughs> started in every facet of the business, but always purposefully selected smaller organizations. The largest company I worked for was just under half a billion dollars in sales, always wanting to work for smaller companies that allowed me to be able to see the through line of the experience of business. So get an opportunity to really understand how does branding affect marketing? How does marketing affect sales? How does sales affect operations? And how does finance run through all of those decisions around a company's business perspectives and growth? And so for me, it was very important to be able to have that kind of level of intimacy and engagement in all areas of the business. So I did that for 25 years. As you mentioned, I created and launched hundreds of physical products around the world, launched really um, to every retailer, I think known to mankind <laughs> around the entire world. So mass retail to specialty channel retails. Of course, when I started 30 years ago, the internet was really just um, you know, a place for communication, not a place for sales. And of course that's changed dramatically over the last 10 to 15 years in particular how consumer products companies use the internet to be able to help to amplify their brand and their message and their impact. So over the history of my career, of course, as needs have changed, retail has grown, it has shrunk, it has changed the way consumers uh, want to shop and buy things. My career has definitely taken a lot of fantastic twists and turns to really understand how best to appeal to who ultimately is the consumer of your of your products in the physical product space, I was to say, or services in the service space, right? No matter what kind of business you're in, it doesn't really matter. You still have a consumer who's going to consume your service or your product. And there you go. And I think you made one really important point, important point now, uh, service-based or product-based business. If you don't twist and turn and, uh, and change with what's happening in the marketplace, you're going to get left behind that. That's for sure. And Corey, uh, I know you're very modest about what you do. You, you don't share too much, but uh, I know you've even been on TV, haven't you? You were in that show, uh, the very popular TV show, The Profits. Yeah, yeah. You're, you're funny that I'm modest. So you don't even think you to talk about that kind of stuff, but that's so fun. That was the fun part, right? And not that all of it wasn't fun, I shouldn't say, but that was kind of the sensationalized fun of, of doing what I did. Um, I did, you know, I worked through my career with not only some of the largest corporate 
brand companies on the planet, but I also had the opportunity to work with the largest retailers in the world. And then also some of the mega celebrities that were involved in helping physical product-based business owners in some of the two most popular shows, The Profit and Shark Tank, which we have relationships. Um, and I work with both. Um, Shark Tank was, of course, Marcus Limonis. And I'm sorry, The Profit was Marcus Limonis. And I did do three episodes of The Profit with him where we were developing brands for him that he had identified that he wanted to be engaged in. And we helped him to understand different manufacturing capacities, production opportunities, operations, excellence. And then of course he had me on the shows as he walked his brand step-by-step step through those different opportunities. So that yeah, was fun. He lived in my town. He used to own a candy store in my town actually. And the kids would say to me, I saw your best friend, Marcus Limonis the other day. <laughs> I said, well, you know, we're, we're business, we're business associates. I don't know about best friends, but anyways. Yeah. But you know, when you work with people who have done more than you have, have maybe lived and breathed deeper, richer experiences, or who have just had different experiences than you've had. There's such a richness, and you know this, uh, Kevin, because of the work that you do, you know, being in a room with people who can elevate your perspective, teach you new things, mm, open up your potential, um, help you to unearth new opportunities that you didn't even know existed, that to me is the most important part of those partnerships. And I mean, I actually did get an opportunity to fly with Marcus to a couple of different events and um, uh, meetings with buyer teams. We actually introduced him to one of our buying teams up at Target, which is a large retailer here in the U.S., and really helping him understand as much as he taught me, I got to teach him about the sequence of events to actually create impact with the retail buyers who are looking for good partners. So there's always that shared collaboration, but you know, my mission has always been to seek out people who could really help me to elevate my understanding of what I'm doing and teach me new things that could make me stronger. I'm a consummate learner. I, I love to learn and grow from others. So yeah, so it was, yeah, yes, the profit. And then of course, Kevin Harrington from the Shark Tank. Of course, we got to work with him, Kevin and I did together. Uh, Kevin Harrington was one of the original sharks for Shark Tank. And still to this day, we talk. In fact, we have a call tomorrow set up to connect on a few things and he's gonna help us promote our book. And he unfortunately just recently was uh, was struck ill. I, COVID I think is going, the second form of COVID is going around the US now. And so he was, he was down for the count for a couple of days, but um, amazing entrepreneur, someone who has, um, also, you know, had billions of dollars of retail sales success with products he's launched and to be able to learn and understand and grow from his, um, his magnitude of business understanding and acumen is just is such a treat. I'm, I'm honored that I get to spend that time learning from him. Yes, and uh, com complete uh, great example of being around people who have, uh, you know, a different richness of experience and knowledge. And we're in the room with you today, Corey. So we're, we're uh, enjoying that richness and experience of your knowledge. I'd love to hear from you. If there's someone listening who has a product that's in the early stages, maybe they're still designing it about to launch, you know, maybe wanting to launch it or get it out there. Do you have any tips or advice on how do they best brand position or, or market to get it out there? So that is such a big question. Oh yeah. <laughs> and the reason why it's a big <laughs> and the reason why it's a big question is because there are so many little micro steps in the process. And those micro steps are are as important as the, the bigger steps, right? And so, and and when you're early in your business and launching products, the reality is there are some really critical things that need to be done. So let me try to focus on those in answering the question. So if you have an idea and you've started to either produce it or found a manufacturer for it, or maybe you wanna take someone else's idea to the market, one of the reasons why I've always focused on consumer psychology is because the most important thing is making the connection between the product and the consumer. You really can't get very far with a great product idea if the consumers aren't convinced that that product is something that they need. So it's really understanding the relationship between developing the solution for the market that you're going after. So if you've identified a product opportunity, understanding and doing the research in the market to critically be able to um, objectively put in some perspective how the consumers are going to rationalize the experience of that product is very, very critical. And some of it, you can create stories around 
and you can create a relationship around an alliance to without the consumer. In other words, there is, you know, that beautiful thing of marketing and crafting stories that the consumers attach onto, but there has to be um, social awareness that connects to the consumer's thought process. So in other words, you can't launch a product in your own bubble, not understanding the value of how the consumer perceives that product. And this can be done in many different ways, but it's important that product business owners take that time early on in the process to understand that, you know, we talk about product reviews as being one of the most critical components in which to early on launch a product. And people say, well, how am I going to get a review on the product before people even use it or try it? And this is the most critical thing is to make sure that you reach out and create a launch team that you can work with that can be part of those early uh, reviews and those early endorsements of the product because their voice is going to be even stronger than your voice. Your, your voice is only going to carry a certain amount of weight and then their voice is going to outweigh yours because consumers want to know what other consumers think. They rely on that system that we've all created through Amazon and TripAdvisor and all those amazing review sites that have allowed consumers to depend on knowing that someone else's review of something is going to validate for them the value of that product purchase. And so it's very important that you understand creating that connection early on is super critical. That uh, social proof in this uh, day and age, uh, sorry, uh, the you know the the consensus of what other people think uh, can be really powerful. So, what you're what you're advocating there is for product reviews. Then, if I'm going to launch a new product, I need to to get some people who would potentially be my idol client, people who are going to be very closely uh, tied to the people I'm targeting. And if we get their insights and their opinions, uh, Corey, that probably helps in two ways. One, it probably helps, as you said, with the uh, the marketing and the story. But I would guess also that feedback is going to help you tweak and change your product dependent on the feedback. Definitely both. So not only do we pick up language and keywords that consumers use in their experience of the product, so that key experience or the, um, I call it the language of love, that they relate to is the language that you want to use back to them. So I was on a call yesterday with a client of mine who's actually a doctor, fabulous guy, awesome. And he's been doing this now for, mm, I think about five years, he's been doing his product. And we've been able to grow it over the last year. But one of the reasons that we've been able to do that is because I sit on those calls and suck out of him conversations in some, time, in, in some uh, instances that allow him to be able to recognize the language that he needs to use to actually connect his understanding of the product with the consumers. So, so yes, yeah, so for sure, from a marketing and sales perspective, from a, a language is very important, but in terms of editing the product and changing the product. So certainly feedback is important. It's also understand that sometimes that feedback, if it comes back misunderstood, it may not be that the product needs to change. It may need to be the audience may need to change or the mm. messaging about the product may need to change. So, so fast, right? Can product-based business owners can get that feeling like, well, no one really wants this product or they're not happy with it or the feedback is not positive, but there's so many layers in that experience. There's so many layers to unearth, to understand what does that really mean? And sometimes what it really means is you need to go back out there and find another hundred people you need to talk to. Yeah. And maybe it's a different group of people. And then maybe you need to re revise that language to be able to create a different um, you know, leadership position with that new market of people before we decide that the product is the problem. So great question, Kevin. It can go down. It's a crapshoot. It can go either way. Yes. Well, you did a great job. I gave you a, a very big question and you answered that so succinctly. I know uh, typically you would get people in a room for three or four days to even begin to, to approach a question like that. So if there's someone listening and they are uh, interested in launching a product or doing more work with a product-based business, is there somewhere they could come to find out more about that and how they might uh, learn more from you or your team around that? Sure. So great question. So Kevin, as you know, when I started my entrepreneurial journey five years ago and left corporate, we really started doing this based on group training programs in a group setting. And it is amazing what you can learn from each other, right? You can learn amazing experiences when you're in a community of people that are all moving through a process together. But since COVID and because of the shift of not being able to travel around the world like we were doing, which was so fabulous and fun, 
I really refocused my attention here in the U.S. market. Now, it doesn't mean that I don't have international clients because I do all over the world. But my focus was to be much more grounded in the experience. And in doing so, I started a private practice about two and a half years ago. And what I've completely done is shift all of my focus into private clients. I find that the experience one-on-one is much more productive than in a group setting in this particular product business because there's so much to unearth in those discussions. And I've seen how productive it can be because clients that signed up the first year signed up the second year with me and we're into third year contracts with these same clients, realizing that having a consultant on board, an advisor on board that understands the continual growth process of the company from pre-revenue all the way up to about $50 million of revenue a year is typically my sweet spot free revenue to 50 million in revenue a year. And within that, there's so many different dimensions to product business growth. So to answer the question, of course, anyone's welcome to reach out to me at rockyourproduct.com. Again, that's rockyourproduct.com. And of course, if you want to reach out to me personally to set up a discovery call, you can reach me at support at rockyourproduct.com and my team will get with you to set up a discovery call. So support at rockyourproduct.com. But I really like to take, if you think that you're in a place where you need an advisor, a mentor, a coach, a consultant to help you to understand better the sequence of events, or one of the things that Kevin, I find people hire me for quite often is just to make sure that they stay out of trouble in regards to how much money they're spending around their business. In today's business life, we have this whole big thing called the internet. And on the internet, there's a lot of tantalizing ways that we can invest and spend our time and money. And so I have to to help my clients navigate all of those distractions through the process or opportunities for their company. And then when you take your product offline, you have just as many opportunities to invest your money. So making sure that we're consciously putting together the objectives of outcomes based on where your business is at today. So we can't act like a big brand when we're a small brand. And when we're a bigger brand, we want to make sure we're doing the right things that are going to align with the consumer's um, uh, expectations around what that size brand is going to be doing for them as consumers. It's very important to understand that sequence of events. So I welcome a 45 minute, I do a 45 minute discovery call. And most 99%, maybe 100% of my clients all come through referrals these days, Kevin. I have an amazing network. And, you know, certainly I open that up to you as well. You know, anyone that wants to um, bring me into their network or help support clients that are really looking to go down this journey. It's a very unique, specific uh, opportunity in business to launch physical products. And once you start transitioning offline into the, what I call the real world, (laughs) you know, what I grew up around, which was you go to a brick and mortar store and you purchase a product. And for a time, people thought that that market was, you know, going to slow down and then the pandemic hit. And I got to tell you, some of the largest retailers in the world are stating that they grew 20 years, 20 years of growth in 24 months based on what happened during the pandemic. Incredible. And these are uh, some of the largest retailers in the world. Mm -hmm. 20 years of growth in two years. That's, uh, that's phenomenal. Yeah, we would all take that, wouldn't we? <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, I actually, I, I don't know if I can handle that. I need a little bit more time to get well, organized and get the, the uh, right things in place to handle that. Yeah. Yeah. And that's a good point because actually those retailers are also feeling growing pains from that. Right. So with bigger opportunities become, you know, there, there are opportunities of, of growth that need to be evaluated and understood. And they very much are feeling that impact as well. You know, Corey, you've been uh, very kind to share a, a lot of thoughts around the strategy uh, around growing a product business and you know, getting the marketing right and getting the, the, you know, the systems and the processes right. But one of the things that you're also an expert in is uh, also around the psychology and the mindset. And you uh, today or certainly this week, you've just released a, a new book called B. And that book is uh, really more uh, as a guide to help uh, entrepreneurs and particularly female entrepreneurs on how to approach entrepreneurial life. So I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about your inspiration for that book and, and maybe share some of the, the key messages or, or values someone will get uh, out of the book if they, uh, or if, when they pick it up and read it. Yeah, no, I appreciate that, Kevin. So I actually have a hard copy of it, which I'm so excited about because I've been traveling and I finally got my hardcover copy. So it was nice to come home and find that here. Um, so be from passion and purpose to product and prosperity. And 
This book started as a collaboration between myself and two other amazing female entrepreneurs. And with 252 million women around the world today that have taken on some form of the entrepreneurial journey, we recognize that women are seeking support. They want to understand conscious leadership. They want to understand living with a purpose, and they want to understand a deeper meaning in their lives as an entrepreneur. And so together, we decided we wanted to unearth all of the potential of females around the world based on our experience and what we've done to build our own businesses and our own, create our own success. And so the book takes us through very poignantly these four parts of business life, right? What your passion's around, how you create purposeful decisions in everything you do and who you engage yourself with. In the product section of the book, we talk about personal branding, and I can get a little bit more into that and what it looks like for early entrepreneurs, but also for seasoned entrepreneurs and how they need to evolve in those areas. And then in the area of prosperity, something for women that sometimes they haven't been given the permission to talk about or to think about, but what does prosperity mean to you? Because it doesn't always mean just money. Financial freedom is important, feeling financial success. Uh, feeling financial validation, all important, but there are so many layers of opportunity that go into what it means to create a prosperous outcome in your own life. And one of the things that was really fascinating when we started writing this book, now, naturally, when I wanted to start writing this book, it was all going to be about launching physical products. And I've written an entire second book about launching physical products. <laughs> so at some point, I will release that book with uh, my co-writers. Um, one of my co-writers in particular, we wrote an entire 12 chapters and how to how to launch a physical um, book, but uh, a physical product. But through the journey, we started a, a Facebook group called the Writing of the Book. And we have almost 10,000 women that started following us about 18, 24 months ago. And it's been an amazing collaboration of Ashley Black, Lisa Franken, and myself, my two co-writers, of finding women on the planet who are looking for an opportunity to elevate or ascend in some capacity. So we do a live podcast once a week. It's on Thursday nights. And I love the live podcasts. We get to interact with the audience. And it's been really amazing. I'm curious to know how many episodes we've done. I need to go back and count because I love that you started it with this is episode, what was it, 120? But I love the idea of understanding how many episodes, because each of those are opportunities to impact people in your community. And it's just such a wonderful thing. So um, I applaud you for doing that as well, Kevin, and, and keeping that consistency, because we all know it's not easy to be to show up for our community every week and, and create that opportunity. But we started this, and what we started to see and find was that women all over the planet were starting to ask questions about what is passion and how do we reinfuse it in our lives? Like we may have had it at one point, but we actually lost that passion feeling. And I would like to just back up and say that our book is really targeted for three different groups of women. And so take this into consideration for any of you women that are out there. And then I would even say it's for men, men who want to empower women around them. But that's a, that's a fourth category of people. <laughs> but those, those women who are starting the entrepreneurial journey, right? Who have chosen a path of some kind of financial or spiritual freedom. They want to move out of a corporate grind or some kind of job they had, or maybe they're starting their entrepreneurial journey from being a mother, but unleashing their ideas, creating solutions in the world and somehow wanting to develop a legacy. And the average age of an entrepreneur is 45. I just did a podcast earlier today with actually two of my clients who have an amazing following themselves. And they're young. They uh, one of them graduated from Harvard, and the other they met in in uh, in in school. And so they were very young. They were in their twenties when they met, and they started their business in their late twenties. And they're just in their late twenties and early thirties right now. They're very young entrepreneurs, but the average age is forty five. So we know that starters doesn't mean that you're just starting your life. It means that you could already be 45, 50, 55, 60 years old and have decided to take this journey on. Number two is seasoned entrepreneurs, and those would be like you and me right? People who are, have been on the entrepreneurial journey could be on it for 10, 15, 30 years. We don't care how long you've been on the journey, but you are seeking a more enriched and deeper experience in your professional life and your business life. Because once you get on that wheel, I mean, we all know that entrepreneurship experience is really 
um, it's really, it's, it's time sucking, it's heart wrenching, it's passion filled, and it really takes a lot out of you as an entrepreneur, but it's beautiful. And there's so many amazing things you get to create along the journey. And one of them as a seasoned entrepreneur is you get to choose to spend more time and different aspects of your personal life and intertwine them in the experience of entrepreneurship. So definitely this is for seasoned entrepreneurs. And then I call it the seekers. And what I like to say is that every woman on the planet, every woman on the planet has some kind of entrepreneurial mindset. I mean, you know, whether you're a mom or you're a corporate warrior or you're a real estate agent, you own a store, you're a practitioner, you're a physician, you're a real estate agent. It doesn't matter where you fall on that spectrum, an interior designer, maybe you're a writer, whatever it is that you've selected to do in your life. You could even be someone who's into philanthropy and you've created a whole you know, a whole opportunity of impact in your life around philanthropy. If you're a seeker and you're looking for something to enrich your life, this experience of this book will really give you that. So breaking down these four categories of passion, purpose, product, and prosperity was really formed from talking to our customers and understanding what they really needed and they wanted in their journey of life. Love it. That's a really great explanation. And that, that fourth group of people, the uh, the men who are listening, I, I read it. I know I now know how to tap into my divine feminine. So I'm very, very thankful for the book. And uh, I know, Corey, e even the, uh, you probably mentioned the secrets there, the final group, but I think uh, even women who are listening may not be massively entrepreneurial right now or may not feel that way. I think there's a lot of value and wisdom in the book. I know you're sharing things in here about how to uh, to manage, I think you describe it as the bitchy voice. So how to manage that, you know, the, the chat that happens in your head. I think that's something that can hold all of us back. So how do we overcome that and manage that? And I know you talk through you know, the power of how do we tap into, you know, this uh, this kind of polarity of masculinity and femininity, femininity and when to use those things. And I know you also talk about... Um, know the vibrational energy that we bring and what that's going to attract to us so there's such a, a vast array of wisdom in this book and I think anyone who's listening uh, should, should pick it up and, and have a read for sure I, I certainly got a lot of value out of it thank you so thank you Kevin I appreciate that and thank you for reading it <laughs> I'm excited to hear all the reviews that are starting to come in and you know just like any good book there are there are gems in every aspect of a book and there's something that's going to relate to you and just like you know we used to talk about when we would do our seminars live you know we'd spend three days with business owners and we would tell them you know you could leave the room at the moment that that section is most important for you because you know when you write a book or you train business owners, you, you don't know where, or people in general, you don't know where those opportunities are in life. You know, you just, you never know where those opportunities are. And so opportunity seekers are always looking for what they are needing next to grow their mind, expand their opportunities and things like that. So there's going to be something in this book for everyone. And that I am very excited about. You mentioned a couple of different things. So the divine feminine and divine masculine, it's interesting because that subject is something I've been talking about for years, but I didn't realize how many people weren't even aware of it, you know, and there's a debate, you know, is it, is it true? Is it real? Is it, and, and yet there's so much literature written about it. There's so much talk about it. I had this huge interview with someone who's, you know, very prolific in her, in her career, in her life. And she talked about how important the divine feminine has been to her experience of her business. So you realize that there's different levels of knowledge and really in this experience, it's understanding that there are different tools that you can tap into as a human being. And yes, every woman and every man on the planet should tap into their divine masculine and their divine feminine, which are, are really opportunities to reclaim and unearth different aspects of how you can be powerful in your life. I'll give you an example. Divine feminine really talks around how there's an emotional component, a, a, a component of collaboration and cooperation and intuition. And yes, women tend to have those things. But growing up in a very masculine society, and you know, I was in corporate for 25 years, and I love my male counterparts. I have two sons. I have a husband of 32 years I'm committed to. Kevin, you know I have two brothers. And the male influence in my life and my career have been profoundly proficient. But the divine masculine is a very strong uh, component that ends up taking women away from 
unleashing that divine feminine. And so one of the things that we're seeing this shift among um, society and women in business is how can they unleash that divine feminine? How can they bring that sense of intuition and who they are back in business? Whereas div divine masculine, which is also important to have things like task oriented and competitiveness, you know, and logical and, and all those things that really go into, you have to have both to be successful in business. You can't just have one or the other. It can be lopsided. But it's how do we even out the playing field more for women and giving them the opportunity to unleash more of their divine feminine. And then you asked about, um, I think you asked about high energy vibration. Yes, I, you refer in there to an awesome book, uh, Power Versus Force. Uh, I think it's David Hawkins. And I mean, it's, I really, really love the whole concept and principle around that. So yeah, if you had more to share on that, I'd love to hear. Yeah. So, so everything in our world is energies and, you know, something that we are not taught in traditional education is how do we unearth those energies around us and how do we create the higher, what we call vibration to attract those energies that we want in our life. And, and since everything in life is energy, when we attract those things that we want, we also attract great people. We attract things that we have either manifested or even uh, projected that we wanted in our lives much more proficiently than by just, um, by, by not thinking about, by not putting that energy out there. And so we talk in the book about the vibrations of circles <laughs> and how we run in those different vibrations, everything from what you eat to the emotions you put out, to the way that you care for your body, to the people you surround yourself with. And the reality is that what we do not look at as um, societally uh, appropriate is actually cutting off cutting off energies in our life that are not helping us achieve the higher vibration. And so it actually is, we, we call it like, like those low energy blockers, <laughs> those things that block you from achieving the experiences that you want to achieve. And I like the fact that you said, you know, there's so many topics in the book that we talk about. Each of these are topics that, you know, are, we're only able to touch the surface, scratch the surface of them. But it is awareness of these opportunities, these tools, these systems, these mechanisms that you can start to uh, dive into on a deeper level once you're aware that they're there to use them for your own personal growth. And you asked about limiting beliefs, and we call it the little bitchy voice in the book. And unfortunately, I think women may have a louder little bitchy voice than men do, <laughs> but I think, we, I think we maybe all have it you know, somewhere in there. And what is the little bitchy voice, right? It's the voice that comes up when we think that we're moving along a path of opportunity. And the little bitchy voice tends to be the thing that comes in. And it's like the, the it brings the past up. It brings our limiting beliefs up. It brings our fear up. It brings the stressors that we may not want to you know, get in the way of, of us. But it brings all those things up when you're in the precipice of an opportunity. It could be the precipice of greatness. You know how many times I've had that experience in my life, Kevin, where people have said to me, you've accomplished so much, you've done so much, you've impacted so many lives, you've changed so many people's businesses. I mean, I'm very fortunate. Look, I don't have some crystal ball. I'm not some magic maker, but I am good at what I do. And I'm able to help people to find breakthroughs of success. And so the reviews, all those things, but still I have those things that come up when I'm asked to do something. Is it possible? I just enrolled two new clients yesterday. And, you know, the first thought you have is, is it possible? And one of the things we talk about with limiting beliefs is worth expansion. Of course, you know, Michelle Masters, someone that we've masterfully been able to work with for years. She is part of our book and she helps us understand that growing and expanding yourself around worth and value is such a brilliant concept to be able to help you to understand how to manage the little bitchy voice when it comes up. Because the reality is those limiting beliefs are going to come up. We're, we are not perfect human beings. I say we live in the most perfect, imperfect environment in our lives. You know, we can be perfectly imperfect. Those limitations are going to come up. And when they do, it's not a matter of learning to reject them. I actually say it's an opportunity to love them. Because if you reject a part of who you are, then you can't be the whole authentic you. And so it's really learning about how to accept those limiting beliefs or maybe weaknesses that we have in our own lives so that we can love on them so much that they can fuel our strengths and fuel the things that we are limitless around, that growth mindset 
the, the, the love for challenge and opportunity and new uniqueness and creativity and all those things that come to us. And it is a very important lesson in the book to understand how to create that shift and love on the entire experience of your life so that you can create the best outcome for yourself and unearth all your potential. I love that. So, and hence the name of the book, Be You, Be Authentic, Be Your Full Self. And you mentioned Michelle Masters. Uh, if you haven't heard of Michelle Masters, then check her out on episode 66 of the Life Changing Questions podcast, because she talks exactly what Corey, she delves into what Corey's talking about here uh, in relation to uh, your money mindset. So if you want to shift that little bitchy voice around your uh, ability to attract and keep money, then I'd highly recommend that one. And Corey, I know you have a hard stop and we need to get you off to your next appointment, but I've got one final question I'd love to ask of you. And that's around the topic of the show, which is life-changing questions. So we say that the quality of the questions you ask yourself impact the quality of your life. With that being true, what's one question that you've asked that's had the biggest positive impact on your life or the life of the audience that you serve? I thought it was such a profound question and I got a few minutes, Kevin, so I don't want to rush you too fast here, but I, I do think it's so profound that you asked this question and such a um, important thing to be asking ourselves, right? And it was interesting that you brought up the limiting beliefs and the little bitchy voice because when you asked me to think about what is the most important question that I asked myself today, and that could change, right? What you asked yourself when you're 30 could be different than when you're 35 and 40 and so on down the path. But what I really ask myself today is if what I'm doing, what I'm thinking, who I'm engaging with, and the purposeful choices I make about where I'm at in my life, if they are actually serving me today in my mission and vision of what I want to accomplish. So my question is, is this serving me to be better at creating opportunities for other, which is my mission in my life at these times? And it's not a self-serving question. I want to be clear on that. It's not all about me. It's all about how do I make sure that I'm doing everything to be the best I can be so I can give my best to those around me. And those around me can be everything from my own family to my incredible community of friends, to my community of business associates that I work with day in, day out. And for me, my life has been all about collaboration in every capacity. When I was young and I was told when I was eight years old that I had a learning disability and I wasn't going to be able to achieve the things in my life that I would set out to achieve. It was someone else's limiting beliefs that they were projecting on me. And so I needed to make a decision at a very young age. How am I going to protect myself? How am I going to be accountable to myself? I was a competitive figure skater for 22 years. And some people may say, well, you know, I'm a very competitive woman in business. But what I learned through that experience was not to compete against others on the planet, but to compete against myself. Because the better I can be, the better I can be to everyone else. I mean, it's no different than the good old sailing. You got to put oxygen on yourself before you could put oxygen on anyone else. You really have to do that. And as a business owner, it's not a choice. It's actually your responsibility to start with yourself. And that's something that I wouldn't say I understood when I was in corporate for 25 years because it was always the corporate mission and, you know, appeasing my bosses and making sure my team was happy. And it was a lot of giving. And it wasn't until about five years ago, I realized that receiving was actually more important to giving because when you receive, you can give endlessly. And look, I give every day, all the time, every conversation, every interaction, I am the ultimate giver. In fact, uh, it's kind of a nickname amongst my friends. You know, they used to, to call me and say I was the Garland girl because I would always connect people together and create opportunities of love and beauty and unearth all these things. But reality is that when you do that for too many years and you give, 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 and you don't recreate the essence of who you are as a human being or continue to feed that along your journey, you get lost somewhere along the way. And it's okay if you get lost, you can pick yourself back up and do it again. But for me, the most important question is, is this serving me? And if it's not, then you need to shift into a new chapter or a new opportunity in your life that is going to serve you in all capacities of what you choose to do. I love that. A really, uh, really profound question and very important because sometimes we don't check in. We, we get uh, stuck in the pattern of doing the same thing, the same thing, the same thing. And so you're asking yourself, is this serving me? And if it's not, then that's a, a clue or a cue to make a different decision, decision and take a different action. Um, and I, I really love the point that you made there, Corey, which is around you starting with yourself. And that's not in any respect to be selfish, 
but you you will have more to give if you're you're recharged you're fueled you have oxygen for yourself then you can serve others and i, I really want to uh, drive home the point you made about receiving it's uh it can be and actually uh, you mentioned about feminine maybe sometimes i know in maybe the women in my life they they uh, I don't know whether it's society, but they want to give, 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 give. And if they don't stop and receive themselves, then of course it uh, ends up feeling tired, burnt out, frustrated, all of those pieces. So it's, uh, it's a really important part of that balance to make sure that we, we do receive, we do make time for ourselves to, to receive the things so that we have more and to give more. So I love that question. It's really fantastic. Corey, you've been an absolute uh, legend on this call today. You shared so much value and wisdom. And uh, I'm going to leave uh, in the notes of this podcast, uh, the links to uh, your Facebook group, where there are 10,000 other amazing female entrepreneurs, and uh, also the link for the book and rock your product. So if you're interested in connecting with Corey, go there and check out those links. And Corey, thank you so much. We, uh, we've been so very grateful and blessed to have you on the call today. Thank you, Kevin. And I will just leave you with, first of all, I'm proud to be part of this community and, and help impact your network in any way that I can and certainly work with um, women around the globe. I work with men too. I love my men. Um, and I love that you brought up how impactful it is, particularly for women who are moms, who are wives, who are um, giving themselves to charity and community, who are, are giving themselves to their schools and then work and create impact. It is very important. And I would just leave you with this last thought, which is so many people want things in life, right? And they want to, um, they want to receive these things. And this kind of ties into my question that I asked myself, which is, does this serve me? And that is, if you want something in life, you have to be it first. And so mm -hmm. if you want love, you have to be love. If you want peace in your life, you have to be peaceful. If you want presence in your life, you have to be present to your own life first. And if you want a beautiful life, you have to be beautiful first. So anything you want is possible as long as you start internally first and then you project it all externally out. So I hope that that leaves your audience feeling fulfilled and ready to go out there and be their best and create the best opportunity in their life. And Kevin, thank you so much. I appreciate you walk, reaching out to me on my book launch week. And I'm so glad that we got to spend this time together. It's been amazing. Me too. And we're going to be left with that for if you want it, be it. So love that, Corey. Thank you so much.